Hello, welcome, I'm Mr King and welcome to this video lesson on the poem Boat Dealing by William Wordsworth. Now, I know from experience that many students are put off by this poem simply because of how long it is. And at 48 lines long, it is the longest poem in the conflict section of the OCR anthology. However, don't be put off. This poem is rich, full of imagery and clever ideas to get your teeth into. Now, before we start, the first thing you should know about this poem is that boat stealing is not actually a poem in its own right. Boat stealing is an extract from a much longer poem called The Prelude, which is an enormously long poem that the poet, William Wordsworth, spent most of his adult life writing, and indeed didn't finish before he died. It's widely considered to be one of the best pieces of work that he produced. Now, he spent a long time writing and rewriting this poem, and the particular version that we're going to study, which is in the OCR anthology, is from the 1799 version of the prelude. Now, if you're studying for the exam board AQA, you will study a slightly different draft of the same extract of the same poem. So if you're studying for the AQA exams, you should know that I'm going to be talking about the OCR's version, the 1799 version, as it appears in the Towards a World Unknown anthology. In this video, first I'll read through the poem with you and check we understand some of the vocabulary. Then I'll discuss the story of the poem, i.e. what is the poem about? And finally, I'll pick out some of the key language and structural techniques you might want to write about in your exams. But before we do all of that, I'd like to ask you a question. Have you ever been terrified by nature? Perhaps you were in a particularly violent storm that terrified you. Or maybe you were on a boat at a time when the seas were particularly violent. In the last month when I'm recording this, there was a powerful earthquake, two powerful earthquakes in California that dominated the news. And as the climate crisis worsens every day, it's becoming more and more common to see stories about horrific weather events damaging the planet every day. Today's poem explores the idea of being terrified by nature. But Wordsworth isn't terrified by storms, waves or earthquakes in this poem. Instead, Wordsworth is terrified by how big and powerful nature is compared to humans who are, by comparison, very small and fleeting. Now, this idea of being terrified by the vastness of nature is key to understanding today's poem. In fact, I'd like to quickly introduce you to a key idea that was common in romantic poetry, the type of poetry in which Wordsworth was writing, when this was written. And this important idea is called the sublime. Now, there are many different understandings of what the sublime means, but the version that I would like to focus on in today's lesson is the sublime is recognising the beauty of nature, but also recognising how terrifying and terrible it can be at the same time. So, if you will, try to imagine uh, a storm at night. And as you see the lightning across the sky and you hear the thunder, you might think, wow, that's beautiful, but also feel terrified at the same time in case the lightning strikes and causes damage. And that feeling of, wow, nature is beautiful, but also terrifying at the same time, is the feeling of the sublime. And the sublime is one of the key ideas in boat stealing. Okay. So before we get into the words of the poem, it's worth having a quick overview of what's going to happen in this poem. This poem describes a real event in William Wordsworth's life. So the narrator in this poem is Wordsworth himself. And this poem describes an event when he was a younger man living in the Lake District, a beautiful part of England with lakes and mountains in it. And when he was a young man, he stole a rowing boat on a lake like this. Now, when Wordsworth stole a rowing boat, he rowed out into the middle of the lake. And if you're not familiar with rowing boats, you have to sit and face away from where you're going towards. So your back is facing uh, where you want to go, and you look back 
at where you've just come. So as William Wordsworth is rowing out into the lake, what he sees is one of these mountains above him. And it's big and it's beautiful and it's a bit overwhelming in the dark. But he's having a good time having stolen this boat rowing out onto the lake. What he can't see is the huge mountain on the very right hand side of the screen. But as Wordsworth rows further out into the middle of the lake, he's able to see over the first mountain and see the even bigger one behind it. And this second mountain is so much bigger than the first and so much more overpowering. But it makes William Wordsworth feel the sublime. He recognises both the beauty and the terror of nature at the same time. He feels very small compared to how big nature is. And for whatever reason, that moment makes him turn around and take the boat right back home, feeling very guilty. So that's what's going to be described in this poem. Let's have a look at the poem, and as we do, we'll go through some of the trickier vocabulary in the poem. So here we are, boat stealing. I went alone into a shepherd's boat, a skiff that to a willow tree was tied within a rocky cave, its usual home. So here, the skiff or the shepherd's boat, uh, these are words to describe the rowing boat that Wordsworth took on that night into the lake. The moon was up, the lake was shining clear among the hoary mountains. So hoary is an adjective which means greyish white. So on that night, the mountains looked greyish white. From the shore, I pushed and struck the oars and struck again in cadence. So cadence is a word which describes a sequence of musical notes. So as he's rowing his boat out into the lake, the sound of the oars splashing in the water sounds beautiful, sounds musical. And my little boat moved on, just like a man who walks with stately step, though bent on speed. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure. Not without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. So here he's saying that as he took his boat out onto the lake, the oars left beautiful ripples in the water, which he describes as small circles glittering idly in the moon. As the moon's reflecting on the water, these ripples, these circles, it looks like they're reflecting in the moon itself. A rocky steep uprose above the cavern of the willow tree. So here, as Wordsworth has rowed away from the shore, remember he's facing that shore, he's looking back at the willow tree in the cavern where he got this boat, he sees the first mountain, which he calls here a rocky steep. The rocky steep mountain uprose, it's big and in front of him. And now, as suited one who proudly rode with his best skill, I fixed a steady view upon the top of that same craggy ridge. So a craggy ridge, again, is another way of describing this first mountain, which he calls the bound of the horizon. It's, all, it's so big, it feels like that's where the world stops. For behind was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. She was an elfin pinnace. Here he's describing his boat as an elfin pinnace, which is a beautiful, oh, a pinnace is a beautiful boat with sails and oars, so he's exaggerating what his boat is really like. But by calling it elfin, it sounds like a fairy tale. He's clearly having a really good time. Twenty times I dipped my oars into the silent lake, and as I rose upon the stroke, my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When, from behind that rocky steep, so from behind that first mountain, till then the bound of a horizon, a huge cliff as if voluntary power instinct upreared its head. So this is the moment where Wordsworth has rode so far into the middle of a lake, but he's finally able to see the even bigger mountain behind the first one. I struck and struck again, and, growing still in stature, becoming still 
The huge cliff rose up between me and the stars, and still, with measured motion, like a living thing, strode after me. So here he says that this mountain was so big, he personifies it. He said it was so big, it feels like it rose up, it stood up between him and the stars. And it, to him, to Wordsworth, it feels like it's coming after him. So with trembling hands I turned and through the silent water stole my way back to the cavern of the willow tree. There in her mooring place I left my bark. So here he's, he's, he's rowed straight back to the shore. He's scared, he's terrified. He calls his boat not an elfin pinnace anymore. He calls it bark. You know, it's no longer exciting to him. It's just a piece of wood that he used to get into the lake and he's, he's rowed straight back home. And through the meadows, homeward went with grave and serious thoughts. And after I'd seen that spectacle, for many days my brain worked with a dim and undetermined sense of unknown nodes of being. In my thoughts there was darkness, call it solitude or blank desertion. No familiar shapes of hourly objects, images of trees, of sea or sky. No colours of green fields, but huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men, moved slowly through my mind by day, and were the troubles of my dreams. Okay. So, to summarise, in this poem, William Wordsworth steals a boat. He takes it out into a lake, and at first he sees this first mountain, which is big and beautiful, he's having a great time. But as he rows further and further into the middle of the lake, he's able to see an even bigger mountain behind it. And this mountain makes him feel terrified. It's beautiful, but he also feels terrified. So this is the feeling of the sublime, which we talked about earlier. As he goes into the lake, he experiences the sublime. And this feeling of beauty and terror encourages him to turn around, take back the stolen boat, feeling very guilty, and he goes home, and he's feeling tremendously guilty. And whereas nature seemed really beautiful to him in the first part of the poem, in the second part, and in the final part, nature seems devoid of life to him, and he is thoroughly miserable. Now, this poem seems quite long, but I think we can make sense of it if we trace a few key ideas through the poem. I think we can break the poem up into three key sections. The first section, I would say, is from lines 1 to 25. And in lines 1 to 25, Wordsworth is stealing the boat and he's having a great time. You can see that he loves it so much because he describes everything as beautiful, like a fairy tale. Small circles glittering idly in the moon on the water. There's sparkling light. His boat is an elfin pinnace. He's having a great time. But then, in lines 26 to 38, we have the second section of the poem. And this is the section where Wordsworth has sailed so far into the lake, he's able to see the huge mountain behind the first one. And this is the moment where he experiences the sublime terror of nature. And we'll see the tone shift from a fairy tale pastoral tone almost into a much darker tone and finally from lines from the second half of line 38 right until the end of the poem in line 48 we see Wordsworth going home and suffering from guilt for stealing the boat but also feeling dejected feeling very upset he's clearly been troubled by his experience of sublime nature of the environment. And so he goes home feeling terrible. Now I think by dividing the poem up into these three sections we'll be able to understand the poem in a little more detail. So you might be thinking, where is the conflict in this poem? After all, this poem appears in the conflict section of the OCR Towards a World Unknown anthology. Well I would suggest there are two conflicts going on here. The first is William Wordsworth's conflict with nature, if you want to put it that way. 
He goes out, he's having a great time, but it's nature which changes his feelings. It's almost like nature challenges him. And that experience of nature is a form of conflict. It causes him to change his actions. So firstly, there's conflict within nature. And secondly, there's internal conflict, especially in the third section I've outlined here. We see the internal conflict going on within Wordsworth, his feelings of guilt for what he did. Now, we can trace Wordsworth's personal development through this poem in a few ways, which I think is really interesting. One way we can see how Wordsworth goes through this journey of conflict with nature and through this journey of internal conflict is by tracing the imagery he uses to describe his boat. At the beginning of the poem, he describes his boat as a shepherd's boat, a skiff. So here we've got a description of a small wooden rowing boat. Nothing remarkable, something which belonged to a shepherd. Nothing uh, particularly flashy, just a simple skiff, a simple shepherd's boat. But as he takes his boat out onto the lake and he's having a great time, he describes it as an elfin pinnace, which you can see uh, pictured here. A much bigger boat with sails would need many oars to row it. It creates a sort of fairy tale tone to the poem. And this change from a shepherd's boat to an elfin pinnace shows how much work is enjoying himself, how life has become so much greater for him in the same way that a boat transformed from a skiff to an elfin pinnace. But once Wordsworth goes through uh, this experience of seeing nature, once he experiences the sublime, the boat is described in a different way yet again. In the second section of the poem, as I've outlined in line 36, the boat is described as his bark, as bits of wood uh, you know, lashed together, um, a bit like this uh, raft that I've pictured here. And here he's managed to make the boat sound uh, even worse, if possible, than how it's described in lines one and two. The boat is not something he can have a joyride with, and it's not something fairy tale like an elfin pinnace. Here is a bit of wood which he used to do something uh, he shouldn't have done by stealing this boat. So just by tracing the boat imagery throughout the poem, you can see words of personal journey from stealing a boat, to having a great time, to feeling utter remorse. We can also see Wordsworth's development through how he describes himself throughout the poem. At the beginning of the poem, he describes himself as alone, and he's stealing the boat. And he described it as an act of stealth. It's almost like he's proud of himself here, the way he described it, an act of stealth. And he's just like a man who walks with stately step. He's calling himself a man here. But as he was quite young when this happened, this is a form of hyperbole. He's making himself sound better, perhaps, than he really was. At the end of the day, he was a young lad who stole a boat. But here, it was an act of stealth. And he's clearly proud of himself. He clearly thinks he's very skilled. Later on in the poem, it says, he acted as suited one who proudly rode with his best skill. And he fixed a steady view upon the top of that same craggy ridge. He sounds like an adventurer. He sounds like an explorer. He clearly thinks a lot of himself at this time. And this proud tone reflects how he feels in nature. But that later changes. We move from someone who's rowing proudly to someone who becomes absolutely still. In the second section of the poem, he grows still in stature. So when he sees this bigger mountain, he freezes, which shows his terror. He also is described as having trembling hands. We can see his guilt and his anxiety through this uh, action here. And then through the meadows homeward went with grave and serious thoughts. So he goes home. He's no longer the explorer. He's no longer the able thief, as he described himself earlier. He is just a young man who has done something he regrets. And he's going home with grave and serious thoughts. So to summarise, in this poem, we see William Wordsworth who has this experience of nature. 
which makes him feel very guilty. We see his conflict with nature, or we see his interaction with nature, which makes him feel very dejected. And we also see his own internal conflict as he comes to, term, comes to terms with the crime he committed. So what we'll do now is we'll pick out some of the structural or language features which might be helpful to think about if you have to write about this in your exam. So let's begin with structure. Now, this poem is written in iambic pentameter. If you're not familiar with iambic pentameter, iambic pentameter is when you have 10 syllables in every line uh, in a pattern of unstressed and a stressed syllable. So it should sound like this, de-dum, 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 de-dum. Um, so Shakespeare was the master of iambic pentameter. Uh, one of his sonnets begins, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And we have this pattern of iambic pentameter in this poem also. I went alone into a shepherd's boat, a skiff to a willow tree was tied. So we have this iambic pentameter. And I would suggest that at the beginning of a poem, this iambic pentameter creates a cheerful and upbeat tone, which reflects Wordsworth's cheerful and upbeat tone when he's stolen the boat. Now, this iambic pentameter is very rarely interrupted by any pauses caused by punctuation. So a pause caused by punctuation we could call a sejura, and it's very rare in the first section of the poem for the iambic pentameter to be interrupted by punctuation, certainly if you compare it to later on where there are many more pauses. And whenever the iambic pentameter is interrupted with a sejura, we're forced to pause after some very pleasant and cheerful imagery. For example, in line 15, there is a sejura, or a full stop, um, after the words sparkling light. So here, the pause forces us to focus on this really positive image of nature, the sparkling light. This is a really clever poetic trick to draw the reader's attention to this beautiful description which highlights the magnificence of nature. However, in the second and third sections of the poem, the flow of the iambic pentameter is interrupted a lot more by punctuation, certainly compared to the first half. And this creates a very fragmented tone, which reflects the poet's fragmented state of mind he's in because he's feeling guilty about stealing the boat. Furthermore, have a look at where some of the pauses are, where some of the sejura are. In line 42, there's a dash which forces us to pause after the words darkness. And again, in the next line, there's a pause, there's a dash after the word desertion. Now again, when we need to pause in a poem, firstly, in this case, it interrupts the flow of iambic pentameter, so it interrupts this cheerful tone we had earlier, but it also forces us to pause and think about the words that came just before the pause. So here, in lines 42 and 43, the sejura force us to pause on the words darkness and on the words on the word desertion. And these two words, which are very dark, very negative connotations, reflect the guilt and possibly trauma Wordsworth feels while he's reflecting on the crime that he has committed. Another structural thing which is really good to focus on is the use of contrast, or if you want to use uh, the more technical term, the use of juxtaposition, although either term is fine. So contrast is when we have two similar ideas um, used fairly close to each other, um, but to present two very different ideas. So what am I on about? Well, let's have a look at line six to seven. In line six to seven, we have this description of the oars. I pushed and struck the oars and struck again in cadence. And the little boat moved on. Now, we have a very similar idea appearing later on in the poem. Uh, we have in line 29, I struck and struck again and growing still in stature. Now, it's not quite repetition. Um, the words aren't exactly the same, but I think it's fair to say that Wordsworth wants us to notice that these two ideas are very similar. But there's a contrast between them. They do different things. The first time we see the idea of the oars, I struck the oars and struck again in cadence, it creates a really beautiful sound. 
the word cadence is used. It creates a really musical tone. Words of it having a great time on the lake, out in nature. This is not the case when we see this same idea appearing later in the poem. Here, in line 29, when he struck and struck again, he grows still in stature. So unlike the first time where the sound of the oars was very pleasant, here the sound of the oars are followed by silence as he grows still. And this contrast highlights the change in mood, the change in Wordsworth's own emotions as he goes through this poem. We have another example of contrast in this poem which I'd like to quickly draw your attention to. In line 20, we have a reference to the bound of the horizon. This is where he's talking about the first mountain that he can see. And he says, behind was nothing but the stars and the grey sky. A really beautiful image. I like to imagine the Milky Way visible in all of its glory behind this first mountain that Wordsworth can see. Later on, we have a similar idea in line 27, the bound of the horizon, a huge cliff as if voluntary power instinct upreared its head. So again, we've got the same idea, the bound of a horizon, but they're doing different things. In the first example in line 20, the bound of the horizon is described incredibly positively. It's followed up by this beautiful imagery of stars in the grey sky. And stars have beautiful, wonderful connotations which mirror Wordsworth's cheerful mood. Later on, in line 27, the first image is contrasted. And here, when he sees the bound of a horizon, he follows up with a huge cliff, as if voluntary power instinct upreared its head. The cliff upreared its head. We've got this personification. We've got this image of the cliff almost like it's sitting up to look down at Wordsworth. He's raising it, the cliff is raising its head. And this is a much darker, much more terrifying image. And the contrast between these two uses of the broad horizon shows how Wordsworth's views about nature have changed. I'd also like to quickly pick out an example of repetition, which is also a structural technique you can talk about. We've got the repetition of a huge cliff in this poem. Okay? And here, I think the huge cliff is repeated just to really emphasise how small humans are in comparison to nature and how overwhelming this sublime experience was. Now let's pick up a few language techniques, a few uh, bits of language you want to pick up on. I'm not going to pick out everything. This poem is rich, full of ideas. I'm just going to pick out a few things which jump out to me. So the first thing I want to pick out is the oxymoron, troubled pleasure, which appears in line 10. So an oxymoron is a phrase with an internal contradiction, like a silent scream or a cold burn. And here we have the phrase troubled pleasure to describe how Wordsworth feels. He feels a bit troubled because he's doing something he shouldn't have done. He's stolen the boat, but he's clearly having a great time, which is why he follows up with the word pleasure. And I think it's fair to say that through most of section one, he is very pleased with himself and having a great time. We also have assonance, which is the repetition of the same vowel sound appearing in this poem, again to show how much Wordsworth is enjoying himself. Have a look at this lovely image here, small circles glittering idly in the moon. So here the I sound is repeated, glittering idly in the moon. So this assonance, the repetition of this I sound, it creates a very cheerful tone which reflects how Wordsworth is feeling. This poem is also rich of metaphors and similes and personification. So let us pick out a few examples. So at the end of section one, as I've outlined it, and again, please don't refer to section one, section two and section three in the exam itself. This is just how I've divided it up to help us understand it. But at the end of um, this section, um, we have a reference to the boat went heaving through the water like a swan. And so this simile here is used to show how graceful his, his moment on the lake is. 
although it is interesting that this beautiful simile is followed up with a dash, um, a pause, uh, we could call it a sejura, but I think it'd be more accurate to call it end stopping because it's causing us to pause at the end of a line. And here, this pause is a moment for us to collect and compose ourselves before we go into this very uh, different section, this much darker section which follows straight afterwards. We then have the personification of the cliff. The cliff rose up between me and the stars. It's almost like this cliff is a rock giant, which is so big it can stand up and block out the beautiful stars described earlier. And it feels to Wordsworth like it's a living thing chasing after him. He has utmost respect for nature. It's almost like it's a living thing um, which can chase after him. But I think this feeling of being chased highlights his intensely negative emotional experience. And then at the end, we have this image. Huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men moved slowly through my mind by day and were the trouble of my dreams. Um, now, I would want to focus on the personification here. And don't get confused about this. Don't let the word like confuse you here. Because it says, the huge and mighty forms that do not live like living men. So it's almost an anti-simile here. I would just ignore that and go straight to the next bit. These huge and mighty forms moved slowly through my mind and it's the moving slowly which is the personification so once he's gone home once he's reflecting on what he has, he has done he has lots of nightmares and in his nightmares these big forms are moving slowly through his mind and are causing him the trouble of his dreams i hope you found that useful this has been uh, my analysis of the poem Boat Stealing by William Wordsworth. If you have any questions about this poem, please do feel free to comment under the video below. Um, and please do like and subscribe if you would like more videos. I hope you found this incredibly useful. And until next time, cheerio.